Cool. I don't really know if I have to introduce myself to y'all, but uh, I still will. My name is Amanda. I am the co-founder of a mining advisory service company. We work with miners and also capital providers. I'm also on the board of TerraWolf. Before that, I was the director of Bitcoin Mining at Fidelity and most recently the head of mining at Galaxy Digital. Today, I want to talk to you about expectations versus reality in mining. And, uh, you know, that those things are quite different. Um, and so before we get started, Obviously, a nice little disclaimer. Um, these are my opinions, not the opinions of any company I work with that I'm on the board of, etc. So uh, you just get full me today in my thoughts and Brandon's thoughts, too. Uh, so the first expectation that I want to talk about is around uh, trading desks and people who are building products for miners and their expectation there on treasury management. Most uh, trading desks think that miners just absolutely love hedging and treasury management. And they all, what we always get is like, why won't miners give me all of their balance sheet for my shitty 2 to 3% yield product that, you know, I, I will give them while they give me all of their Bitcoin. And this is like one of a reoccurring theme that I hear over and over again from trading desks um, or from like trading companies and lending companies. And it gets me every time because it's so obvious to me that like miners are just miners. They're not they're not traders. They're not, you know, really thinking about, you know, things in like a, a low yield perspective. And you know, I want to go through why, hypothetically, your 2% yield product sucks from a miner's perspective. So the first reason is there's third-party risk, risk with limited reward. And we all know what happened the last time that risk and reward was mismatched, right? Like a lot of people got burnt. But you know, there's more reasons why. Additionally, there's a high switching cost for miners with, again, limited reward. So a miner has to re-KYC, they have to like figure out like if you're the right group, due diligence you, onboard, while still running their mining operation. And that's like a really hard thing to do, right? So unless the, the, you know, the bar is really high for a small yield, and it doesn't make sense for a miner to go through all of that work and, and you know, only get a small amount on the other side. The next is that you know, these low yield products that people are offering to miners are capital inefficient. Uh, miners need to be able to use their treasury when it's best for them. So if it's you know, time to build, try, time to you know, buy a site, time to buy miners, they have to time the market effectively. And if their Bitcoin is held up and encumbered by somebody else and they can't get it quickly, that becomes a really hard thing for them to be able to grow and scale. Uh, next up, you know, miners have traditionally been looked up looked at as a proxy to buying Bitcoin. So treasury management hasn't been a huge focus for them because they've been focused on operations and growing, right? Miners have been looked at as a growth company. Um, that doesn't mean that will change. Um, and then, you know, this is the, the part that I think is the most interesting. Um, I think that how miners look at yields is if their operations work really, really well, they can get like a 2 to 3% yield from operational efficiency. So you can have power strategies that get you more uh, than 2%. You can get you know, create operational upgrades, firmware, software, and that will get you a higher yield than giving all of your Bitcoin to a trading desk or a treasury management company for a really low cost yield. So, you know, those are the reasons why I think that, you know, the yield products aren't that, that great for miners and why people aren't, aren't uh, using them. I think, you know, the other thing that's really important is that when you think about miners, they're, they're really, people think that they're all the same when they're building products, right? That all miners are, are looking for the same type of solution. And, and what we're seeing is that people are building really for what products they want miners to use versus what products that miners actually need, right? And when you think about miners just not being the same and building a product for miners, even just like general strategies of miners and also power strategies of miners and infrastructure strategies of miners, there's a lot of different ways that people are building their companies now. So on the general strategy side, you have people doing diversified AI. Uh, you have pure play Bitcoin miners. You have altcoin miners. You have pure play Bitcoin miners. You have international. You have USA, right? Uh, you have purchasing ASICs. You have people building ASICs. You have people that are fully hodling their Bitcoin. You have people that are fully selling it and you know, people doing all the different types of things in between. Um, on the infrastructure side, there's also a lot of different strategies that miners are taking, and especially on the energy management side too, right? Depending on where your site is or what type of site is, the, the needs that you have for capital are different there than you know, uh, somebody else. So it's really hard, I think, for uh, like from a miner's perspective to build a single product that will serve all of these groups, right? without thinking about what works for them. Um, you think about miners being all the same, and I, you know, they're not, but there is one thing that I think they all have in common. 
they all want capital. <laughs> so, um, you know, to, to that's, that's like the one thing that miners are constantly looking for. So I think what miners want is access to non-dilutive financing in an unsecured fashion. So if you can build products around that, I think, you know, things will be really good. There needs to be new novel solutions for miners, and they just don't exist um, in the world today. Um, there are some cool products that exist that I like. Um, I can only name two, really. So <laughs> one is Luxor's hash rate derivatives. Matt Williams gave me a bunch of different information, and I'm not going to do it justice, but they offer, um, you know, being able to sell your hash rate forward or doing something different um, there. And so that's like an opportunity for miners if they're trying to get your know, treasury management diversification. Another is uh, Coinbase. They have this, this interesting cold storage to hot storage uh, margin call solution, which are longer terms. So you don't have to, you know, when you have to move money around to say like buy machines or something, you have a little bit more time with Coinbase than you do other uh, providers. So I you know, talk a lot about, you know, what miners need um, and how, you know, the financial markets aren't really providing miners with things that they need. But I want to switch to how we're thinking about miners uh, generally from like an analyst perspective. And, you know, we shit on trading desks for a little bit. Let's like shit on miners and analysts for a little bit. It'll be fun. Um, so right now, the reality is that miners are growth companies and they're not. They should be a return on capital business. And that's not how they're lo being looked at right now. Um, when we analyze miners, there we go, there we go. When we analyze miners, the focus should be on how miners are deploying cap, capital efficiently, and how they're generating free cash flow. And that's, that's not how we're looking at it now. The, we shouldn't care about miners' future hash rate growth as much as their current operational excellence. Um, and, and, you know, they, miners generally have not been held accountable for this. They haven't been held accountable for return on capital. And in, in fact, they've been quite value destructive. And you could look at that from like an SG&A cost. So here's a list of the top nine mining companies um, with names excluded because I'd like to keep some of my friends through this. And we could look at like the SG&A cost alone. Of the SG&A cost as a percentage of revenue, that range is 16 to 62%. And the average is 33%, right? So that's pretty high cost. And you might say like, oh, well, there's no way that a miner could return capital over a 12-month basis, right? Because that's hard. This is a high capital business, right? Like, how do you get that back? And sure, f fair criticism, right? But I, I challenge you to look at the, the last couple of years and tell me if they were return on capital business because they weren't. Um, the real big takeaway from this is that of the top nine NASDAQ listed companies, only two of them had a positive return on capital over the past 12 months. So real investors, right, they want to invest in profit generating businesses. That seems obvious. So like how are our miners going to start to become profit generating businesses? Um, I think we have to hold like analysts accountable for that too. We see analysts, you know, judging miners based on these growth companies. It would be nice if we could look at them from like an operational perspective and see how they're doing there. Um, there are some nuances with the data because, uh, you know, it it's, can be a little bit difficult. The first uh, two things that we want to talk about, how we think about it is depreciation and stock-based compensation are real costs. Uh, so those should be considered, and, and they were. Um, there's generally no consistency when you're pulling information from public miners on where they're storing a lot of their information. So it becomes difficult to compare apples to apples. So it would be wonderful if we can get on some industry standards from a, a financial perspective. Um, also, it appears that some of the numbers in in like the financials are showing like the not the cost basis of what they bought machines at, but more what's being booked for. So, you know, they've obviously been depreciated down because the value has gone down. But so the numbers could actually be worse than what they look up there, um, just because they probably are. Um, and lastly, there's there's a few outliers. Obviously, the past few years, we've had a crazy uh, time. We've had bankruptcies, mergers, et cetera, and that makes it a little bit more difficult to pull information. Um, so, yeah, I guess what's, what's the silver lining, right? Um, and, and where are we going? I think that consolidation is happening, and we're seeing that happen, and that's good for the space. Maybe we'll get some, uh, you know, more uh, interesting ways to, to value miners in the future, and, and we'll see, like, some groups pull together that are going to do things better than what existed before. I think the best thing about mining is that only the strongest survive. So if you're not good at what you do, then you're eventually not going to make it. Um, 
Also, you know, this diversification of businesses, I think, will bring in new investors and it will bring in new standards that everyone else will then have to abide by. And lastly, maybe I'm wrong about it all and Bitcoin's just going to the moon and we're going to make mining great again and it's going to all be good. Um, so, yeah, that is it from me. Um, like I said, my name is Amanda. Here's my contact information. Feel free to reach out with any questions. Um, up next, we're going to bring a few people on stage and have a conversation with people who are actually building and managing things. So thank you. Next year, we are bringing the Bitcoin Conference to the American West, Las Vegas. The brightest minds in the world will converge to deliver Bitcoin history. Buy your tickets now at b.tc slash conference slash 2025.